This meeting is being recorded. Very good. All righty. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce Michael Kambach, um, director of the Creative Vision Factory. And the uh, good evening. And, you know, the work that they're doing uh, with individuals that are having behavioral health issues and or um, addictive issues is uh, a, a form of recovery where they're using a lot of creative art methods. So uh, with that, it's a pleasure having you, Michael, and we look forward to your presentation. So thank you for joining us and we'll turn it over to you. All right, well, thanks for having me. I'm uh, <clears throat> taking a look at this uh, Peace and Justice work group and the speakers that you've you've already had over the past few years. I'm, re I'm really honored to join those ranks and um, I'm really looking forward to sharing with you a project that has really been, um, oh, I can't even describe how special it's been. You know, uh, so it's um, it's been bittersweet because we're we're likely heading into our last year in downtown Wilmington at six seventeen North Shipley Street. And uh, mm -hmm. ever since I left the uh, University of Delaware MFA program in in the spring of two thousand eight, in the midst of that financial crisis, which seems quaint compared to what we've survived, um, I've been working in downtown Wilmington, and uh, I really uh, uh, I really love downtown. I, I feel like the, the two block radius right around the 600 block of Shipley Street where I've been working is just a, a lot of blood, sweat and tears have gone into that place. And without further ado, I'm looking forward to sharing uh, you know, this special program. Um, before I share my screen, I just want to let you know uh, that I have these slides timed. And so it, it will run for like approximately 30 minutes. And so there's going to be a bunch of images. We're going to flood you with images, probably like 12 years worth of images. But we're going to tell uh, the whole story of the Creative Vision Factory. And uh, this, the images, we begin and uh, end at the Delaware State Hospital. And so um, without further ado, I'm going to share my screen here. And we'll get started. There we go. All right, so the Creative Vision Factory, um, like I said, we are, uh, th just this past December, we celebrated our 12 year anniversary. The Creative Vision Factory was born out of a Department of Justice lawsuit against the Delaware State Hospital. Back in 2010, the DOJ sued Delaware for being out of compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Olmstead Act, which guarantees uh, that that people should be able to receive their healthcare services in the least segregated environment. So legalese for do not warehouse people. And so um, we get our start at the Creative Vision Factory um, uh, knowing of uh, the conditions that people were living in at the state hospital and understanding that um, these conditions at the state hospital, uh, I just wanna back up a second. Uh, these stones, it's like these stones at the state hospital cemeteries, the Farnhurst Cemetery, these numbered stones, and the stones of the spiral cemetery at the Delaware State Hospital, um, only having numbers on it really tells you a lot. You know, uh, the, the, the DOJ settlement agreement really brought in an effort to try to, um, you know, correct some harms, but also to... Um, really centered a person's experience. And it, it seems so so very clear that when a, when a person is only remembered by, by a number, they're not really remembered at all. And so, um, you know, um, the Creative Vision Factory, like I said, we are a drop-in art studio uh, funded by the Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health. Um, we operate much like a I, I tell people to imagine a high school art room ripped out of the school system and just dropped onto the streets. And when we first opened up, we immediately had a group of artists uh, that we had already identified who are already working at a local drop-in uh, uh, shelter uh, center called the Rick Van Story Resource Center. And we started working, um, we immediately started putting on exhibitions. We created a, a place for people to, to stay and work. And it was it was so evident that uh, there was a ton of talent within this population. Um, but the amount of uh, skills that 
these individuals had and uh, the stories that they had um, really paled in comparison to just the, the effort it, it takes for, for these individuals just to survive and show up. Um, you know, every art room that I've ever been in, when I was um, right out of undergrad, I was a high school art teacher for three years. And during that time period, um, it was really amazing to me because, you know, what I never put on any of my resumes is that I am in a drug and alcohol recovery. My uh, second senior year of college was my first year clean and sober. And when I, um, you know, when I, when I graduated from school, I ended up landing a teaching job in rural Virginia, Westmoreland County, Virginia. And I ended up all of a sudden being in charge of 120 students every single day. And it's being on the other side of the desk, I started to see um, that a lot of these kids needed to be in that room, that something else was going on with them. And it, it was reminding me that when I was a senior in high school, I was in the art room maybe two to three periods a day. I didn't have a language then that, um, you know, the art room was a space where I was basically treating a lot of underlying anxiety was a place where I could, it was, it was okay to be a little different. It was okay to be a little weird. Um, but it was also a place where I started to like gain a lot of agency. I started to meet, meet friends. We started putting on exhibitions and it's this community of support that comes from being in a space, making work together that really it's like every single art room that I've ever been in has been a place of becoming. And so when we have, a bunch of unhoused individuals, people on the behavioral health spectrum, people experiencing extreme states, you know, very rarely do we have um, an opportunity to kind of hang out with them, to, to, uh, to work together, to showcase their work, to share these talents. And over the years, we're seeing images here from Geraldo Gonzalez, right before the pandemic hit, he, his work was accepted in the Outsider Art Fair in New York City. And this image right here, um, here's Geraldo standing next to the artwork of Martin Ramirez. Uh, Martin Ramirez, uh, during the Great Depression, uh, was a, uh, a farmhand uh, from Mexico working in California. When the Depression hit and he lost his job, he was found inside a vacant house uh, confused, didn't know the language, and uh, he ended up spending the rest of his adult life in the California State Hospital system. There was, during that time period, uh, a pretty robust arts and theater program inside that state hospital. But to see Geraldo Gonzalez standing right next to this Martin Ramirez, uh, these Martin Ramirez works, really reminded me that we have come a long way. You know, in some respects, we've come a really long way. You know, Geraldo in another era could have, could have been completely institutionalized. And, you know, here at the Outsider Art Fair in January 2020, um, you know, his work is being celebrated. Uh, you will notice uh, Geraldo, he, he makes uh, technicolor public transit drawings. Uh, he does a lot of work with DART. Um, it's just really a, a joy to have. Um, but working with him there, uh, this was a real moment for us because in January 2020, you know, if you would ask me what success looked like when we first opened up the Creative Vision Factory, I'd probably tell you that one of our artists would be in the Outsider Art Fair, uh, that maybe they'd have work published in Raw Vision magazine. And uh, Geraldo that night, he not only was in the fair, but he also, this, this image on the right here, he was also featured in Raw Vision Magazine, a centerfold article that was co-written by Nancy Josephson, a neighbor of ours, uh, and Dr. Ann Bowler, who's a professor at the University of Delaware. And so, um, you know, that was kind of a high watermark pre-pandemic, having one of our artists featured on such a big stage. Um, but really quickly, and uh, you know, uh, you know, heading into the pandemic. Uh, when everything shut down, uh, we were reading, me and my team were reading this book by Dr. Vicki Reynolds called Justice Doing at the Intersections of Power. And Dr. Dr. Reynolds has this analysis that, you know, people who are working in social services, people who are working with the unhoused, with people with addiction, 
that they're not that they're not burned out that we need to move away from that kind of like mental health term that medicalized term and we need to understand that these individuals are not burned out they're they're heartbroken and under resourced and if we are going to do right by the people that we work with and if we are going to stay well enough in the work we need to know that that we are doing justice by these individuals and we are also not violating our own kind of our own ethics our own morals and that's where really the burnout really resides in this sector of the seeing day after day that there's no solutions waiting for these individuals, that there's no affordable housing or there's no innovations with, uh, with shelters. And we continue to see unaffordable, unaccessible units uh, rise above us. And so what was interesting to me is that winter, we were reading this text by Dr. Vicki Reynolds. And then uh, in March of 2020, everything comes to a grinding halt. And this is an image from, from that first week of the state shutdown. We immediately uh, knew, that we knew that we, we served a lot of people experiencing homelessness, but we never had the experience of seeing them all outside of our glass doors looking for answers. And so in those early weeks, uh, we immediately posted our Wi-Fi password. We created this makeshift charging station we immediately started surveying people at the door, asking, you know, where did you stay last night? Uh, if you were offered a hotel voucher, would you accept it? And what are the top three items that you need? And so immediately we we launch into this uh, um, mutual aid campaign uh, and start collecting names and started to advocate immediately uh, for uh, hotel vouchers and some sort of stay. Looking back, it, it felt like everything happened really quickly, but looking back, it actually took five weeks for us to get 120 individuals placed in the downtown Sheridan. And so I remember at that time, it, it felt like a huge success. You know, it, found, it felt like, okay, you know, we, we really did some heavy lifting here. We got people into the shelter. Uh, you know, everything's great. Well, that, that summer then, we head right into the summer of 2020. And, um, you know, that summer of protest, while people were staying in the temporary uh, shelters, we immediately started hearing the good and bad and the ugly of these temporary hotel stays. We had individuals who were kicked out on the first day. We had individuals who were kicked out after a week. Uh, we had, you know, a handful of individuals who actually did get connected to services and get connected to work. And of course, you know, the state and programs love to shine a spotlight on those individuals. But the one thing that we know about so many of those individuals is that they're going to succeed no matter what, that their resilience and their grit is going to rise. It's nothing that we did or systems did to, to help advance this individual. And what we are really learning from this temporary hotel stay is just like the, the, the deep amount of trauma that's underlying the conditions that somebody finds themselves out on the street. And so, you know, that summer after we got to meet, uh, you know, 120 people into the downtown Sheridan, a real bittersweet moment for us was that as soon as we uh, got people out, we started uh, witnessing the construction of what is now called Crosby uh, Hill. Uh, this is a 203 unit luxury apartment complex that's actually one block down from Creative Vision Factory and is uh, a big part of why uh, we'll be leaving downtown uh, sometime in the summer of 2024. Um, oftentimes when I'm giving talks, I, I start off with this video. So I'm going to take a little break right now and we're going to watch a, a video that it, it, in less than four minutes tells the story of one Michael Solomon pictured here. Uh, now Michael started off as one of our members and then became a, a project foreman for our public art project. So in this video, you're going to hear about Michael's story. And I just want to say that this is a very common way for people to come into the Creative Vision Factory. It feels like a very common story over the years. Uh, but what Michael was able to do for us and with us and with our people is, was very unique. And so we'll let him tell it from here. We have a lot of stories. Michael's story, I think, starts off. Um, in a really genuine, ordinary way. When my wife passed away, I sort of went over the edge with that. It was it was messy, man. I was just like irritated, pissed off at the borough. I don't know. 
came in here trying to solve a problem and that he could use this address to reactivate, I think, food stamps. And I came in every day like intoxicated. I was either drinking or high off of something. I saw Michael walk back and forth and I didn't pay attention. I didn't even know he was who he is. And uh, one day he approached me and said, uh, let me show you what we do here. Let me tell you what we do here. And he did the whole thing. He introduced me to a pencil and a piece of paper. You know, and I started sketching. I think uh, it may have been a year later that we were getting ready for the Kalmar Nickel mural on the east side, our first large scale project. But I got a hold of him because I knew that I was going to need somebody on site to be like a, a project foreman. And I just knew he was the right guy for the spot. Got off of probation. Um, he sent me to Philadelphia to take courses with the Mental Health Association for a couple weeks. Um, and right after that, there I am, uh, <laughs> an artist. You know, if you saw us in any other element other than paint, you might think we were like some kind of crew crew. The same people that you see panhandling out in front of your stores or bumming cigarettes from you walking down the street are the people that are doing these projects. And this mosaic wall across the street at the Christiana Cultural Arts Center we employed, I believe, eight people from here. And some of them knew how to grout, some of them knew how to do you know, different things, and they all put their talents together. That's how we completed their work. It's a really good feeling to know that I can give back to what somebody gave to me, you know. I can make somebody else feel the way I feel. I come here, you know, like this is part of my life. It's like, this is what we do every day, all day. This is our reality. And to see someone else feeling that same feeling, it's like, yeah, yeah, now you see how I feel. So now it's your turn to pass it on to the next person and to the next person. Hopefully it grows, it continues to grow. That's the extra little something that this stuff gives back to you that, you know, I, I don't know how to quantify that. I don't know how to put that in an Excel spreadsheet or report to the Joint Finance Committee, but I know it's important. And so towards the, uh, the summer of 2020, uh, we tragically lost Michael Solomon to a heart attack. And in the weeks before his death, um, we found this really great poster from uh, Stephen Powers, who's this uh, really great graffiti artist named, who goes by the name Espo. And uh, you know, I said to Michael, I was like, man, we got to get one of these posters because look, uh, the dollies left tires flat on this poster. And and the, the dolly that we have at Creative Vision Factory has a flat left tire. And, um, and so it's a bittersweet moment. You know, Michael's passing. Um, I still have to, our, our folks were so displaced from the pandemic that I'm still to this day uh, informing people that Michael passed away. And uh, here, here he is at the original uh, DPC Spiral Cemetery Monument. Uh, the stones at the Spiral Cemetery only had numbers. This monument created a, a tiled directory that connects the numbers to names. However, after the second winter of that original monument, uh, it started to fall apart. The tile was fired uh, at the wrong temperature, the wrong clay body was used, and uh, the pandemic actually gave us an opportunity to come back to DPC to correct uh, this failed project. Uh, we also were able to uh, bring this tile workshop and these uh, floral tiles that we did in the redesign, we we're able to bring them to the Newcastle County Hope Center. And so these are work from images from workshops at the Newcastle County Hope Center. Uh, early in the pandemic, we, we weren't sure if we would ever be able to make kind of like, you know, large scale communal artworks together uh, just because of social distancing. And we have that summer, we ended up working with uh, Newcastle County because we got wind that they were considering uh, using CARES Act dollars to purchase um, 
to purchase what is now the Hope Center. And so um, we actually held focus groups in the parking lot of Creative Vision Factory, and we're able to get uh, Carrie Casey and uh, the rest of Matt Meyer's team at the Hope Center. We're able to get them in front of 75 people who experienced the first wave of the downtown Sheridan emergency hotel stay. And so that enabled Carrie and her team to open the Hope Center on day one with uh, an understanding of the hardships that people were going through. And they were able to lower those barriers that are so often barriers of, of temporary shelters, emergency shelters. They don't take into account the extreme amount of trauma the individual's been through. And when you hit, you, you hit people with a bunch of rules, I, I guarantee you that they're, they're going to violate them in that state. And so being able to work at the, at the Hope Center, to be able to spread out in their banquet hall and to make these tiles and to, uh, and to rebuild uh, the DPC Spiral Cemetery, uh, it was just, uh, it was very meaningful for us. Uh, you know, one, you know, uh, the, the, the initial failed monument uh, was just, you know, the bane of my existence. You know, it's like I, I wanted to get back to fix this thing, but I was also like very like knees deep into some, some real difficulties at the Creative Vision Factory, difficulties serving our population, difficulties with, without enough resources, um, not enough staff, um, all kinds of challenges. And so the, uh, the rebuilding of, of the Spiral Cemetery coming out of the, uh, the pandemic was really huge for us, but we were also able to, um, um, you know, during this time period, we also uh, began working um, on another series of public art, uh, public artworks with the Winter Tour Museum. And it was a part of a collaboration and a proposal that Winter Tour put out um, looking for somebody to make a, a multi-site public art project using upcycled materials. And so we knew that we were going to be rebuilding the state hospital monument. Uh, and oftentimes, uh, you know, we'll use, like in the mosaics here, we're using a bunch of uh, tile, pro tile from other projects. And so... Uh, the workshop that we ended up doing with Winter Tour Museum, uh, the idea is that we were going to be doing a lot of research on American tile making, uh, different tile manufacturers across the country, but we're also going to be revisiting a couple projects and upcycling tile from those projects into new forms. And so the idea at Winter Tour is that I was gonna spend some time out there to do some research, um, kind of dig, dig into materials out there, and uh, years before, I had started a, an artist in residence program at Winter Tour, bringing in contemporary artists to have access to the collection. And then ultimately, they would, um, after a year's worth of time with the collection, would put on an exhibition down at Chris White Gallery in Shipley Lofts in downtown. Uh, this time, uh, me getting to be the artist in residence at Winter Tour, my original plan was to be in the library, but I ended up spending the vast majority of my time out in the, the, the wild country garden, 60 acre garden that surrounds the museum and the library. And for me, this was a moment where I started to realize the, the intensity of the experience that I had just been through at the Creative Vision Factory, um, really realizing that, you know, kind of being out in nature, being out in the garden, something was happening to me physically where I was really kind of, I was drawn to the garden. Uh, I started going on long walks out there. I started doing, uh, having all my meetings out in the garden as walking meetings. And suddenly too, the, the garden out there started to remind me of a place from my childhood. Uh, shortly after my parents divorced, uh, we moved out to Somerset County, Pennsylvania. Uh, this is a place called Chestnut Hill Farm. Uh, my grandparents ended up, uh, uh, were working at Chestnut Hill Farm as caretakers of the property. And so um, as a kid, I had I had a run of this this really expensive place that had all these like ski lodges and people's second and third homes and the people were never there. And, uh, you know, my grandfather would always make sure that the pipes didn't freeze and it was cutting the grass and maintaining the property. But as a, as a young kid, I had run of the place and I also had run of like being being able to go in and out of all these houses and just like see things that were just like, I, I would never would have seen before as a, as a kid come from the kind of poverty that I came from. And so my time with my grandparents at Chestnut Hill Farm, um, you know, the older that I get 
and the, and the more that I've kind of been dealing with my own recovery and my own complex PTSD is I realized that that time that I spent as a kid with my grandparents out at Chestnut Hill Farm in nature, it was like I was living with a couple of Buddhas. And my grandparents at this point in time, you know, have you know survived the Depression, World War II. My grandfather had you know worked 30 years in U.S. Steel. It was a really special um, time period for me. And, and working with a lot of the people that I work with, um, you know, uh, the longtime director of Friendship House, Bill Perkins, he used to say that, you know, he, he wants us to get away from the word recovery because often many of the people that we're working with, they don't have, there's nothing, there's no sense of normalcy. There's no sense of safety to recover. And, um, and, and for him, he was saying, you know, we really have to promote discovery being able to discover there's a that there's a new way to carry life there's a new way to go about things i always thought that i really loved that insight from bill but then too it's like uh you know my time out of winter tour also was spent uh you know investigating material learning about clay learning about tile learning about tile manufacturing uh we also were investigating you know because of uh several failures on projects you know what, what kind of adhesives did they use on tile inside of tunnels. Also, I became really fascinated with the, the Minton tile uh, that, that makes up the, the tile floor of the US Capitol. How is it that Minton tile can last for over a hundred years and you can walk on these floors? Uh, part of the, the, the big uh, disgrace for me on January 16th is the desecration of, of, of the museum that is the Capitol. And every time I look at these pictures, this gentleman is actually from downstate. Um, I can't help but think of the Minton tile and also these historical uh, displays. Uh, my wife's uncle, Scott Strong, uh, you know, he ended up spending the last few months of his, his time at the Capitol cataloging objects from January 6th. He was the material culture curator of the U.S. Senate and worked there for 40 years. And um, you know, through Uncle Scott, I've had amazing access to the Capitol and to, you know, all the material of this, this living museum of democracy. And so anyways, here's, a, here's the star of the show, Faith Kuhn. Uh, this, this picture is uh, when we uh, gave Ashley Biden a tour of the Farnhurst Cemetery. And so during um, our, our work, too, uh, you know, many people recognize this, this tunnel as a part of the Jack Markell bike trail. But if you're inside this tunnel, about 100 yards to the east lies the Farnhurst Cemetery, the oldest cemetery on the state hospital grounds um, that was once connected to the Newcastle County Alms House. And so back in when the highway was constructed, this overpass, uh, you know, 295 that heads to Delaware Memorial Bridge, is built directly over top of 85 percent of the cemetery. And so we, uh, we were working on a proposal. The proposal was not funded, uh, but I would still like to think that this, this is a project that is infinitely doable. An idea uh, to tile that tunnel, to commemorate the lives underneath the highway on this east side of the tunnel, and then on the west side of the tunnel to commemorate the ecological impacts of the highway construction on this area. And so, um, you know, it's a project that I think is worth keeping alive. Uh, and definitely somehow, some way, we're going to have some nod to Farnhurst Cemetery here at the Jack Markell bike trail and particularly this tunnel. Um, definitely going to make it happen somehow, some way. Uh, but also uh, during my time at Winter Tour, uh, it became really clear that I also needed to go up to Moravian Tile Works in Doylestown, PA. And Moravian Tile Works uh, is operated by um, uh, Bucks County Parks and Rec kind of as a living museum. I love this little tile inside of, uh, inside of Henry Mercer's house. Uh, the same technique is this technique that we used at the, um, on the Christina Culture Arts mosaic wall that was featured in the Michael Solomon video. And so uh, the, the technique of scraffito is where you carve off the top layer of glaze to reveal the clay color underneath. And this uh, scraffito tile saying shiver no more uh, on, on the outside of this fireplace, uh, it was really touching for us. You know, a, a big part of uh, the work that we do with tile and thinking about tile and thinking about tiles and homes, and so much of our work that's centered around home uh, is really advocating for our artists and friends who have no home. 
and that really that recovery and wellness and getting well, it, it starts with like, it starts with rest. And if there's no rest and there's no home, there's no recovery and there's no health or wellness to be had. And so, um, you know, working up uh, at Moravian Tile Works, visiting uh, Henry Mercer's house, uh, Fawn Hill Castle, uh, it was amazing to me how he, uh, he framed his, his tile collection of tile all over the world inside his house with his own Moravian tile that he was producing in the studio uh, just down the street. And this little segment here gave me an idea for the, the bench planter that we were going to make at the Winter Tour Museum. And so the, the project that we ended up making at Winter Tour, we ended up making a, a whole bunch of handmade tiles that would become reservoirs for broken dishware that would connect to uh, connect to couples, connect to people, lost loved ones, family. Uh, this is a dish pattern that was uh, from my wife and I's wedding. Uh, this is a little note. Uh, my Aunt Mary was uh, my partner here on this project. I, I wanted her to collect dishes that connected to all of my great Irish aunts. And my great Irish aunt, Ann Martin, uh, this is a piece that's directly tied to, to Ann. Uh, she's one of my rebel aunts. Uh, and she's also a visual artist. Uh, you know, Ann, when she was young, uh, was a nun, but ended up leaving the convent and, and lived out her life uh, as an art teacher in, in Pittsburgh public schools and uh, was always encouraged me as a maker. Uh, and uh, and it, it's just really great to be able to commemorate Anne and have a little piece of Anne on this bench. But then too, uh, here's a tile that connects to my uncle Walter. And we also have uh, tiles here that uh, connect back to the president. This is a, a plate that once belonged to President Biden uh, when I was working on this project, I said to Ashley, I was like, look, I'm going to leave two tiles for you. Uh, can you give me a plate that connects to your family? And so um, she got me this plate. It was, it was funny because I had to meet some Secret Service officers uh, and pick it up. It felt like a drug deal to get this plate. And, um, and here it is right before I, I got to break it on the floor of the Creative Vision Factory. I'm turning it into these tiles here. And so this project is on view right now at the uh, right in front of the galleries at the Winter Tour Museum. Um, you know, our time there, too, we were also, uh, you know, doing work where we're, we're looking at objects within the collection at the museum. This is where we learned of, you know, the forms um, called flower pockets where, you know, ceramic objects that you can hang that would be for the display of flowers. Here's a picture of the uh, completed bench. Now with this bench, we ended up with the upcycled bench project. We made three of them. One is in front of the Newcastle County Hope Center. One's in front of the Winter Tour Museum. And another one is at Duffy's Hope Garden on the east side of Wilmington. On the Winter Tour bench, all the tile on the top, and you'll see here, uh, there's my son Thurman, who is considerably younger then. Uh, we have gray tile here and then this pattern tile. All of this tile came from the Habitat for Humanity Restore. And so we up upcycled that tile. And uh, a big part of uh, what we were doing with these benches is that we initially, we brought in the uh, conservation and preventative conservation scholars at the Winter Tour and talked to them about the failures that we experienced at the DPC Cemetery Monument. And what they ended up saying to us is that, look, like, um, you know, a big part of what you're doing is you just got to, like, take better notes and pay attention. And so each one of these benches, we had a, a combination of tile that we upcycled and we didn't exactly know, you know what type of tile this was that we were getting from the restore. And so um, each bench, we used a different set of adhesives, a different set of grout, and then we just let them kind of sit out, sit out in the conditions and just paid attention to how they broke down. And so, um, Again, too, here at the Creative Vision Factory, we this is a, during the pandemic, I actually completed a, uh, a handmade kitchen backsplash in my own kitchen. I handmade every one of these tiles. We also do a bunch of uh, ceramic vases. And these two uh, vessels actually connect. These are, these belong to my grandmother. So uh, this is where my grandmother kind of put sugar in my uh, cereal at Chestnut Hill Farm and and I just love these two, these two vessels really take me back to that, that time period. 
uh, the bench at Duffy's Hope Garden. We had, we, we had done a mosaic project there years ago, uh, but it was on top of a cement board that was mounted to raised beds that were made out of wood. And so we always knew it was going to be a temporary shelf life. And so we were able to upcycle the original tile from the original mosaics from the garden onto this bench planter at Duffy's Hope Garden. And the portrait here of Alice Dunbar Nelson, uh, we actually commissioned this portrait um, uh, from uh, the ceramic artist named Hope Hummingbird. Now, Hope Hummingbird is not her real name. That's actually her anonymous graffiti name. Hope Hummingbird is actually a graffiti ceramic artist. And there's a, she works out of uh, Austin, Texas now, but she has a lot of her work up in Philadelphia. If you ever see like a blue, uh, a blue hummingbird glued to a building, yeah, no, that no, that is the graffiti of Hope Hummingbird. And on her uh, on her uh, Instagram page, I, I realized that she does a bunch of portraits, and we reached out to her to do two portraits: the Alice Dunbar Nelson bench that's at Duffy's Hope Garden, and then she also did a portrait of Michael Solomon for the bench that we created at at the Newcastle County Hope Center. And so this is an image of the original mosaics at Duffy's Hope. And here you see them uh, upcycled on the bench there that we made with winter tour. And here's another, uh, another tile uh, for another, uh, another gardener who I really love, uh, uh, Conrad Kometz. He was the gardener who, who created the garden at Duffy's Hope Garden. But he's also an avid baseball player, and so I, I handmade this tile in the in the shape of home plate, and it commemorates uh, Conrad's service to uh, to the nonprofit Duffy's Hope. And then here we are with uh, the Michael Solomon uh, portrait. Uh, this bench planter is in front of the Newcastle County Hope Center, and the cool thing about this front too is that all of these tiles on the front of this bench connect the projects to Mike that Michael and I made together. Uh, throughout the city. So this purple tile connects to the Christina Cultural Arts mosaic wall. These orange ones connect to Duffy's Hope. Uh, and this is actually a, uh, a Leo tile made from uh, at Moravian Tile Works. And my absolute favorite element of this bench are these green tiles on the, on the corners. These green tiles are actually a part of the original facade of Creative Vision Factory's location at 617 North Shipley Street. I was able to chisel off some of that tile. So an actual piece of our building is connected to the Solomon bench. In the Scrafito uh, workshop that we did at the Hope Center for the bench uh, there, you know, we ask, asked people to, to think about and write you know, what home means to them. And so here's another project of, um, of Michael. And again, this is a project where we experienced some tile failure. Uh, some of this tile uh, did not did not hold up, and so we've come back and 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 fixed this repeatedly. We actually replaced the bottom of this tile as well. And so, the benches, as they started to wear and as they were exposed to the elements, we started to learn about uh, the quality of the tile by how it broke down. And so when tile kind of flakes and chips like this, this is very indicative of the failure of the first uh, generation of DPC monument. Uh, this indicates that the tile is a low fire ceramic tile and a low fire ceramic tile allows for water absorption. And so in our, uh, in our kind of geographic area, you know, you're gonna have freezing and if you are absorbing water and then it's freezing and then unfreezing, this is where the freezing and unfreezing leads to this particular type of flaking. And so we're in, able to uh, ultimately replace these tiles. Uh, this was a uh, ultimately an adhesive failure of a Fiesta Ware uh, butter dish that we utilized uh, as a part of the winter tour bench. And again, too, it's like paying attention to how it broke down. Uh, we were able to fix this with a different type of adhesive and uh, you know, this is a, uh, uh, a detail of a, a Joyce Kozloff mosaic wall down to Wilmington train station too. And so taking uh, this, this new knowledge of how things break down really kind of leads us to solutions of how do you create a permanent fix? What's really going on? And, uh, 
it was kind of a way for us to kind of lean into these failures. The, the Newcastle County uh, Potter's Field, too, this was the other side of the Delaware Psychiatric Center Spiral Cemetery Monument. Uh, during the second rebuild, the expansion of the Newcastle County Potter's Field, uh, it became really evident that we were going to have to make another directory for the expansion of the Potter's Field that, again, was getting these kind of stone placards that only had numbers on them. And so here's an example of the grid that we put on the back of that monument. And you can see that these tiles are flaking, whereas these tiles are not. And so when we get tile from a place like the Habitat for Humanity Restore, it's, it can be really difficult to know what exactly you have. And, you know, unfortunately, the best way to find out is just to leave it outside and, uh, you know, conditions will tell you. And so these pictures, while we were working with Winter Tour and learning all about material, uh, our second rebuild of the monument started to show signs of wear and breakage. And I remember a few weeks before uh, the critical failure, uh, we started seeing evidences, evidence of this kind of cracking. And this second failure of the monument um, really hit me. It really hit me like a death to, to see that we put all this effort into the second rebuild we got the tile right this time, but here we had an adhesive failure. And the adhesive that we've been using up to this time on all of our public projects uh, was called uh, uh, MAPE Type 1. It's the same adhesive that Isaiah Zagar uses up at Philly Magic Gardens. But the, the key distinction here is that uh, when we were using this adhesive, we were using this adhesive on walls um, that weren't freestanding that actually uh, were kind of temperature controlled, like the sides of buildings where water would kind of fall off the front. And what we have with a freestanding cinder block wall in the middle of a cemetery is that it's absorbing a lot of water. As the water was coming into it, it was absorbing a lot of water. And this particular adhesive, uh, you know, obviously did not hold up. It started to flake and the whole thing fell down. And so the cracks that we were initially seeing were the cracks on our corner tile due to the weight of the front of the directory pulling those tiles down. And so, like I said, this uh, second failure really felt like a, um, it felt like a death. Uh, we had just had a really big uh, public ceremony and Faith can attest to it. We had like everybody and their brother there and um, I was just riddled with shame after this, this failure. Now, the big difference though is that we were already working in concert with uh, the world-renowned Winter Tour Museum. And I love this other tile placard from Hope Hummingbird. Uh, Gather the people you trust, support each other, then resist. You know, and uh, to be able to go back, in, in spite of all the odds that we we're up against serving people at the peak of the pandemic, we were also able to, and you know, Real close friends of mine get a kick out of this because, uh, you know, Mayor Przicki is not the not the best friend to the Creative Vision Factory or to me personally. Uh, but here he is at the opening of, uh, well, an announcement, really, of a partnership that we had with the Delaware Art Museum called Public Art Stewards. And the Public Art Stewards program was a workforce pilot program that was training a cohort of individuals that included two Creative Vision Factory members and train them up on kind of preservation methodologies, condition reports, and the maintenance of public sculpture. And so during this program, uh, our artists were working with a preventative conservationist from trained at Winter Tour. And uh, you know, this cohort was working with public art throughout the city. We started doing adhesive tests with this group. And here's a, the, when I knew we finally probably had the exact right adhesive, is when I saw this, um, this picture right here. This is one of our flower pockets that we built for the DPC monument. And it is actually holding a cinder block. <laughs> and so uh, this uh, adhesive Ardex X77, if you ever wanna stick a tile on something and have it never fall off, purchase this stuff. It's, a, it's amazing, I can, I can tell you all about it. But uh, the Public Art Stewards uh, program, uh, was a really great initiative in that it got, a, it got a lot of our folks out learning about public art making, but also promoting for the proper care and maintenance 
and also really speaking to funders that we, we need to have a, a plan up front as to how long do we want this to last? What is the kind of maintenance plan? These are, these are costs that a lot of public art making is not thinking about up front. And what will end up happening is that it will just erode in front of our eyes. And so um, it was a great learning experience and we were able to create uh, a lot of that learning into what turned into the third rebuild of the DPC project. Now is when we get out here for the third time is where, you know, I personally really started to have a kind of crisis because this whole year we are all over all these years, we thought we were correcting a historical wrong by, you know, connecting these names to these numbers. And during this time period that it took for us to finally get this project right, we see the expansion of the Newcastle County Potter's Field now greatly outnumbers the number of souls that was in the historic cemetery. And these stones are significantly different from the historical stones. You know, uh, the historical stones now, all of a sudden, the, the chiseled numbers and like old chunks of granite now certainly seem to have a lot more dignity than just small poured concrete stones with stamped numbers that far exceed the numbers in the historical cemetery. And so Creative Vision Factory, me and my team, we have been bearing witness to a, a, a lot of premature death. You know, uh, the whole program gets started with this DOJ lawsuit against the state hospital. And what we've seen in that 12 years is we've seen a lot of our close friends and, and staff, we, we've seen them die. We've seen their health erode. We've seen their, you know, conditions of health just completely, you know, this road, we're seeing people lose all their teeth. We're seeing compounding uh, side effects of being on anti-psychiatric medication long term. And so for us, like we used to say all the time, you know, when we were rebuilding that monument twice and three times, we always wondered about the names on those tiles. What were their lives like? What kind of lives did they live? You know, we don't have to wonder about the lives that are being buried in the Newcastle County Potter's Field expansion. We've been serving them for the past 12 years. And so this is really where the, uh, the heartache is really kind of set in for me and my team is that uh, in so many respects, we've, we've gotten so much right. You know, the story of, you know, Geraldo Gonzalez over, you know, Martin Ramirez spending his entire life in the state hospital system. But in many other respects, we are really behind the eight ball. And, um, and for us, it's like, you know, after all this years of, of working in advocacy, you know, half of what we call uh, substance use disorder, half of what we call mental illness, I can't help but see is just very predictable, uh, very predictable behavior in the face of extreme conditions. Like very extreme conditions. And in these extreme conditions, the drug use starts to make total sense. You know, we're in a opioid crisis, uh, but when you talk to people who are using opioids, you know, they'll tell you things like, you know, that, that it feels like they've been hugged by their grandmother. You know, and that opioids, they work on not just physical pain, but they work on emotional pain, spiritual pain. And the accessibility of these drugs, it's out on the street for less than a pack of cigarettes. And so if we can't house people, if people's health is eroding and there's a substance out there that's cheaper than a pack of cigarettes that makes you feel like you've been hugged by your grandmother, what do you think is going to happen? And so what we're seeing at the Creative Vision Factory is that we need to center housing above everything else. If we don't center housing first with an individual, that person will never feel the kind of the safety that, that, that they need to feel to get the rest that they need to start to grow, to start to recover. And so here we see the Creative Vision Factory today. There's the lovely Crosby Hill uh, sky rise that is ultimately threatening us. And uh, you know, this past December art loop, you know, we, we celebrated our 12 year anniversary there on the block. But it took until this year for me to see uh, my members literally sleeping out in the street. Uh, you know, when I saw this scene, you know, I, I was just so grateful that somebody gave this woman Carvette a pillow that night. And just a, a week before she was on the streets, she she lost her fiance to to a, a fentanyl uh, overdose. And um, 
you know, the conditions have been pretty gnarly. You know, it took until this, you know, it took until 2023 for me to see one of our most prolific artists sleeping in front of our building with his girlfriend who has cerebral palsy. And so, you know, there's lots of stories of success in, in downtown Wilmington right now. I know there's a lot of cheerleading for improvements in downtown Wilmington, but it's it's been a really hard dichotomy for me to hold. The amount of suffering uh, is significant. The amount of pain is significant. Like I said, the amount of premature death is really the, the, the norm. Um, and despite all this, there's still so much creativity. There's still so much connection. There's still so much beauty. And there's so much potential when people get together uh, and, and you know, support one another. You know, the peer support that the individuals have at the Creative Vision Factory, it always blows my mind. You know, people come in and immediately start sharing resources, immediately start sharing food, immediately start keeping each other well. And um, it has become this little safe harbor where people can come in. I, I think that, you know, 12 years of our history, what we've probably done that that's very overshadowed is that we've provided like trauma-informed accessible restrooms to people who are or who are so other that they're basically locked out of every downtown facility that's not the library, not an emergency room, or not the creative vision factory. And so Michael, uh, Michael. I don't want to interrupt uh because the conversation has been unbelievably interesting and impacted, but I want to open an opportunity for some of the people here to see if they have any questions um, for you. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm I'm back. This are, these are the last images right here. So I'll just let that play. And when we get okay. to the, just at the last slide. So yeah, if anybody has any questions, uh, we are also, you know, Monday through Friday. Uh, well, we're now, we're now open Tuesday through Friday from 10 to five. And, um, and then two for the uh, February and March art loops, we'll have open houses. And so um, okay. I would invite everybody to keep their eyes out for um, information about an open house. Uh, we're on Facebook. We also have an Instagram page. And um, but it looks like February Art Loop and March Art Loop may be our, our last public events at that location. We're going to learn in uh, sometime between March and April whether or not we secure our next five-year contract. And if so, we, we'll, we'll be merging with the organization called Impact Life, and we'll be looking for another location. Okay. Well, thank you. Yep. Well, the, the conversation has, has really been exceptional, as I mentioned earlier. Um, one of the things that came to my mind was you know, you're talking about these opportunities, not only for the, the students that you have, but, you know, working with others. Um, from a financial perspective, how are you getting money? <laughs> well, our, keep, this, our, keep this going on. Yeah, our, our contract is um, with the Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health. But like, I, I like the, you know, Chris, Chris Rock once said, you know, what your boss is really telling you when you make minimum wage is that he'd pay you less if he could, but it's against the law. And mm -hmm. so community mental health, like Delaware had to be sued by the DOJ to seed these peer run community me mental health centers. 12 years later, the division of substance abuse and mental health is trying to like, you know, they're not giving us more resources. It's always like, do, do more with less. And so, uh, the contract for the peer centers, 100% of our funding comes from this contract. And so, um, you know, looking ahead, if we secure this next contract, that's great. But we definitely, as a program, need to kind of diversify. And back when we were making a lot of robust public artworks, that's basically how we were doing it. You know, uh, we did a, a large scale piece at Stubbs Elementary School. Uh, we did another large-scale mural at Shortledge Academy, funded by Delaware Children and Families First. And so those extra projects brought in additional revenue. Uh, and then what we did with that, too, is, is made sure that we, we created opportunities for our folks to, you know, make $15 an hour, you know, learning how to teach workshops or learning how to install these projects. And getting our folks out in public, meeting other people, working in schools, 
And I'll, I'll never forget the first time one of our guys, like we had somebody just come up and tell us like how beautiful the project was. And, and one of my guys said during like a, a smoke break, he was like, you know, no one's ever like told me I've done a good job at anything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's like that kind of like feedback. You know, I, I remember saying to him at the, at the time, I was like, look, like that's what I'm, that's like my new drug. That's what I'm hooked to. It's like, I, I, I love to make stuff happen. I love to like have that kind of interaction. It's like, it's, there's an energy to it. And, um, you know, so back when we were kind of making like robust public art, I feel like that is the kind of like that, that was kind of the norm. And so some of the stuff that we're looking to get back to is to do just that. And, and we're envisioning a kind of a, a community ceramic studio where we would be making ceramic home goods, but also uh, be making tile that could be used for residential, commercial, in addition to kind of like fine arts, monuments and murals. But like I said, you know, we could also be making, you know, uh, you know, tile backsplashes, kitchen floors. And I'm telling you, it's, it's impossible. One, it's impossible to get in a fight when you're polishing tile mm. and making tile and making artwork. Like I've never had anybody get in a fight with anybody when they're like had their hands full with something and they're doing and making. And uh, we do uh, twice a day at the Creative Vision Factory, we do group meditations followed by a check-in meeting. And uh, the meditations have grown to be really, really popular, but it's always this, this really great opportunity for us to remind people that you, you know what else is a really great meditation is just is making. Making, mm-hmm. doing, writing, music, you know, um, all of us who are involved in the arts, you know, know this intuitively. I've never had to explain my mission to writers, musicians, or artists. It's just like they intuitively get the importance of having a place where you can get together and do these things. Um, but then, too, it's like with my training as an artist, like the whole time I was in graduate school, I never openly talked about what art making did for my health. You know, I would just, I would be shunned if I talked like that. And so, you know, I feel like, Creative Vision Factory has also kind of been a coming out for me to talk about the the, the holistic and health impacts that, that a creative practice does have for me. You know, it's a huge part of how I stay grounded and stay connected. Uh, but then too, it's like, for me, it's like the magic of the art room has always been about connection with others. And it's, mm. a, it's really interesting to me. It's like, you know, years later, I now have a language that, you know, I'm probably what it's been for me is like, a, a forum for parallel play you know it's like i can i can sit in a room and make that one there was a slide that i had early on that said the the ancestral urge to craft and talk shit with your besties like that that is like that's the mission right there at creative vision sure. Factory. like what we learn from one another just sitting together engaged in some sort of parallel play or some sort of doing that's where we really start to see like what's going on with the individual, what's underneath all the stereotypes, all the, all the stigma, all the facade mm-hmm. and really get to know people on a felt level. Um, it, that's powerful stuff. But then too, it's like that informs our, our advocacy. And I think the, the, the health of having peers involved in your system, particularly on the advocacy side is that, that we've lived it. We've been through it. We've been through these systems. We've been snarled by these systems. And then two, it's a, you know, when we start to get out of it, you know, we may be one or two steps ahead of somebody who's right behind us, but that willingness to pull people back up. And when you're navigating these systems, like you need to know who is the right person for me to talk to at the Porter Center? Who is the right person for me to talk to at Friendship House? How do I get from point A to point B? How do I, how do I eat in the city of Wilmington if I have nothing? You know, mm-hmm. our folks immediately become Sherpas for the newly unhoused, for that new person that ends up at the at the Sunday breakfast mission. You know, we have uh, just a, the amazing support and amazing uh, frontline workers within this population. Over the past 12 years, I've done nine Narcan overdose reversals. I'm telling you, nine reversals, that's something that like somebody I know who's living in a tent city They'll do nine reversals in one month, all right? Mm-hmm. So, so, so much of this kind of frontline first responder work is is landing on the very people who are up against these extreme conditions. And and and, and again, too, it's like the behaviors. They're they're born of these extreme conditions. You know, mm-hmm. it's like twelve years into this work, 
like I said, half of what we call mental health or mental illness or a diagnosis to me just sounds like very predictable, normal responses to extreme conditions. Yeah. It present. And it's like seeing psychosis in that way, you know, again, too, it's like it's not something that's so abnormal and so extreme. You know, there, there's, in, you know, in indigenous traditions that see this kind of presentation as like a, as a gift. That if we if we see like it's an indication that there's something wrong with our ecosystem, that there's something wrong with our whole community. Like imagine if we had an approach like that rather than just trying to put like heavy antipsychotics, because that's what our, our public health system right now. If you're poor in this country, our public health system or two, even like our homeless services are going to try to like hit you with coercive mental health treatment. And what that looks like is is forced medication. And so mm-hmm. I've seen a lot of people on really heavy anti-psychiatric meds and for them to be effective, you have to be on them consistently. And for you to do anything consistently, you need to have a stable roof. You need to have an accessible bathroom. And if you don't have those things, I just like what we're seeing too is in addition to extreme behavior born out of extreme conditions, we're probably seeing a lot of just open withdrawaling from heavy antipsychotics. And then two, is a, a lot of the data shows this, that coming off of antipsychotics after you've been on them for a period of 10 years, you may ex- now ex- experience symptoms that are like 10 times as worse than the original ones you were originally treated for. Mm. And so, uh, so much of the work, like I said, it's like if you're doing the work and you're in these spaces, it's, it's, it's a no brainer that housing is the treatment. And what we're seeing too right now in, in the opioid crisis, which I'm starting to come around to like seeing it, you know, not as a crisis, but as a poisoning. You know, I'm having friends of mine tell me that this is what like the, the AIDS epidemic felt like. It's like, cause we're up against a problem where we actually have tools. We actually mm-hmm. have the tools to reverse overdose. We actually have the tools to be able to test this contaminated drug supply but we're not able to get these tools out there because we're up against still to this day, so much stigma and so much judgment around the use. And I just challenge everybody, anybody to tell me like, where has the criminal prosecution of drug use given us any kind of positive health outcomes, any kind of positive collective benefit? You know, this past year I was in the governor's office pleading with them to not make fentanyl, like a level three felony. They're trying to make the mere possession of certain quantities of drugs to be a violent felony in and of itself. And it's just like, you know, where is this coming? Like, where is this coming from? It's, it seems to be like a kind of like crack law redux for fentanyl. And so there's also an argument that the, the contaminated dangerous drug supply has actually been born out of our crackdowns on the regulated prescription opioids. And now we have this, you know, right now the the drug supply is so thoroughly contaminated that there is no like clean supply to choose from. Mm. So it's it's been, you know, it's been really fascinating. We're kind of like putting, you know, all the stuff that we've been able to see with our own eyes, but also to be able to look at other models, other systems, you know, uh, Dr. Vicki Reynolds, like uh, Dr. Gabor Mate, spent a lot of time working in Vancouver about like 10, 20 years ago. This is kind of the epicenter of the harm reduction movement. And so we, we now have, um, in New York City, On Point New York City is operating the only two uh, overdose prevention centers here in the United States. But the overdose prevention centers are a common part of the infrastructure in Europe, common part of the infrastructure in Canada. And these are facilities where people can come in and be able to use their drugs in a safe environment with safe, safe tools, testing, and then too, all the equipment that you would need to reverse an overdose. And, uh, you know, I got to meet Sam Rivera, the the founding director of On Point New York City at a harm reduction conference here in Wilmington in September. He was telling me that oftentimes they don't even have to use Narcan. It's just about like, you know, being able to connect somebody who's in an overdose to to oxygen. And so there's ways to keep people safe. Um, There's tools out there that, that can do so. There's models that are, 
that are that are really doing the job. Um, but again, we're we're up against prohibition. We're up against still a lot of antiquated laws and and antiquated thinking on on how to treat this. And um, you know, we definitely have a public health crisis on our hands. And housing is definitely definitely a linchpin. Is definitely a, a real cornerstone that we really have to address. Well, thank you for that, Sue. You're on mute. Well, Michael, I can't thank you enough for what you've shared with us and the 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 um, interconnections and the uh, just the the story and a different view of a population that I think so many people, so many of us, have stereotypes about, beliefs about, without knowledge. Um, We've heard from Faith about the cemetery and about the monument, um, but the three attempts, I just finished watching the movie Nyad when Diana Nyad tried umpteen times to swim from Cuba to the Keys. And it reminds me of your story of building the monument at the, uh, at, at the, uh, at the hospital. Um, What's extraordinary to me is that we walk by the Creative Vision Factory the first Friday of every month when we have our first Friday Walks for Peace. And we walk right by it. And we don't see it. And we don't know it. And we certainly don't know what lies beneath it, behind it. And I can't thank you enough for bringing that to light. Um, I think that it's extraordinary how our vision follows a um, an established path and new elements don't penetrate. And so what you've done is you've exposed a whole different perspective on so many different aspects of art, of community, of support. Um, and I think we are all different as a consequence of hearing this. I hope you are on the um, art loop in February and March, and we will encourage people to come. And um, I, I sort of am stunned at the prospect of no established contract for your work to continue because I sort of can't imagine it. We've been and we've been waiting all year even to have the new contract terms. Like the the new contract was supposed to hit the street in March. Then they told us that it would be released in April, then June, then August. And during this time period, too, I have Rob Buccini and Mayor Pazicki breathing down my neck. And I've just been saying like saying that I was like, look, I, I I can't start to talk about moving until I know for certain that I have funding on the sure. other side. Sure. I like, you want to help speed this up, by all means, bring some resources to the table. You know, this well, is please, me. Please keep in please keep in touch with us. Let us know what's happening and certainly let us know if there in whatever ways we can be useful. Um, I, I don't quite know what those are at the moment, but um, the work that you're doing is really extraordinary. And um, and the impact that you have had on on so many lives, some of which you see, some of which you don't. Uh, we just want to thank you uh, for sharing that with us. I would also invite you, uh, you know, um, our, you know, February and, and March Art Loop will likely participate and have open houses. But then, too, it's probably we're going to be probably packing up at that point. Um, but I would invite anybody too at, at 11 o'clock and at three o'clock, the first hour of our shifts. We do a guided meditation as a group and we have a group check in meeting. Anybody can come to that. All right. And it's it's a it's a powerful space to be in. And for like uh, the the morning shift, we, we've been doing a meditation coursework and we did a loving kindness meditation series with Sharon Salzberg this past year. We liked it so much that we repeated the like 15 day program. I think we did it like four times in a row. 
And so it's a, it's been a powerful tool and it's a great way to be in community and just uh, invite people to come, like see people, get connected. And that's 11 and three, Tuesday to Friday? Yep. yep. All right. Well, okay. I hope um, that some of us and some that we know will come and have that experience. Uh, thank you so much, Michael. Mike, let me turn it back to you to close this out for tonight. All right. Well, again, as Sue mentioned, um, there, there's so much opportunity if more and more people know about it. And having you present us today was a great opportunity for us to learn and pass the word. So we thank you so much for your uh, presentation. We look forward to seeing you again. And thank you, Faith, thank for you. your work in this as well and for being part of all of this. Thank you so much. And thank you to the rest of you for being here this evening. And we'll hope to see you next week for another intriguing program. Less, less complex, less interwoven, but an important issue, originalism in the interpretation of the United States Constitution. So from art to law, um, we'll talk about anything and everything. We'll look forward to seeing you. Also, want to do a quick plug: the ninety-nine percent invisible podcast in t throughout twenty twenty-four is going to be doing a book club on one of my favorite books, *The Power Broker* by Robert Caro, and they're going to be covering one hundred pages per month. And so it's just like huge book connects with everything when it comes to cities. So. All right. Yeah, keep an eye out for that. Thank you so much, Michael. Good night, um, everybody. Good night, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night.